questions this evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I hope everyone is enjoying the summer despite not being able to cool off in a movie theater. And that if you're in greater Boston, uh, you haven't lost power from the giant thunderstorm that just passed through. <laughs> uh, today, we have a great program. Uh, we'll be looking at how Boston appears in the film. This is the second program in a series exploring the topic. If you missed the first program, the idea for the series sprang from the realization that although Boston is a small city with a population well under a million, it holds an unusually prominent spot as a location for Academy Award winning films. Since 1990, more Oscar winning films have been set in greater Boston than any other American city except New York and LA. When we started looking into this, we realized that award-winning films set in Boston are gritty, dark films that are often associated with working-class neighborhoods like South Boston or Charleston. In our last uh, program, Ty Burr coined the term the th three-decker genre for these types of films. However, we knew that this is not the only image of Boston. There are comedies, period pieces, and films that depict the diversity of the city with much greater accuracy. Next up, Wonderland, Paper Chase, and Between the Lines have not received the same uh, attention from the Academy, but they have a devout following and depict a different vision of Boston. Our discussion today will look at these other visions of the city uh, and independent productions that offer a wider perspective of Boston. I would like to thank the Brattle Theatre in Cambridge and Emerson College for their co-sponsorship of this series. I would also highlight that the Brattle Theatre has posted a virtual repertory series on their website that complements these programs and explores Boston and film. We will distribute a link to the series after the program. While you're at the website, I hope you'll also consider supporting the Brattle Film Foundation. Independent theaters have been hit very hard by the economic shutdown caused by COVID-19. And although theaters can theoretically reopen during phase three in Massachusetts, uh, the requirements are so complicated that many of them are not able uh, to open in a profitable way. Independent theaters are part of what makes Metro Boston great. So I hope you'll consider supporting the Brattle Theater or the Somerville Theater or the Coolidge Corner Theater or whatever local independent theater, uh, whatever your local independent theater is. So let me introduce our panelists today and give a quick explanation of the format of the program. Today we are joined by Ned Hinkle, the creative director of the Brattle Theater. Ned began working at the Brattle in 1996, while the theater was operated by the Beacon Cinema Group. In 2001, Ned, working with Ivy Moylan, the Brattle's executive director, uh, founded the Brattle Film Foundation and took over the lease of the theater. He has been the creative director ever since. Ned will be joined by Jim Vrabel, who is a Boston historian. He is the author of A People's History to the New Boston and When in Boston, A Timeline and Almanac. He's also a very active chronicler of Boston history, maintaining a Boston history database that includes tens of thousands of entries on significant events, buildings, and changes to the environment. We are also joined by Peter Drummy, who is the Stephen T. Riley Librarian for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Peter has worked at MHS since 1978 and has a deep knowledge of Boston and New England. He is known as a great authority and helps many researchers. He frequently appears on local media outlets offering historical perspective and has probably been thanked in the acknowledgments of more books than most people will read in their lifetime. Uh, so to give you a sense of the format of the program, uh, Ned Hinkle will start us off uh, with about a 10 to 15 minute overview of Boston films that are outside the three-decker genre. Uh, he will be followed by Jim Vrabel, who will highlight a few films and help us understand how historically accurate some depictions of Boston are. Uh, Peter Drummy will then discuss one lesser known film that gives a good depiction of Boston. Um, however, uh, while it's giving generally a good depiction of Boston, it actually falsely uh, represents MHS uh, as a stand in for the MFA. So it's kind of a little irony there. Uh, we will then have a moderated discussion and finally open the program up for questions from the audience. So uh, if you have comments, questions, or complaints, uh, you can reach out to me or Sarah Bertulli, our public programs coordinator. And you can reach us uh, by writing to programs at masshist.org. Uh, I'd also point out that the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, has been planning and hosting virtual programs uh, since the uh, beginning of the COVID shutdown. We've offered all of these for free, uh, but we are an independent nonprofit organization that's supported by uh, the donations of our members and supporters. So if you enjoy these programs, we hope you'll consider supporting MHS. So without further ado, uh, Ned, I'm gonna ask you to join us. Thanks. Uh, I am going to uh, share this uh, presentation. There we go. Um, and uh, as Gavin said, the beginning of this uh, program dealt with sort of 
more crime oriented movies uh, as Ty Burr coined them, the three decker film or the triple decker film. But there are a lot of films uh, obviously made in Boston and about Boston um, that go beyond that subject. And when Gavin first approached us about being involved in this program, we talked about this sort of dichotomy that there were these crime films and then there were films that focused more on the um, high class, upper crust, hyper educated uh, vision of Boston. Um, when I started thinking about that more succinctly, I guess, we, um, we came up with an idea of institutional films. Um, so obviously Harvard is, uh, dominates these films. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from a movie I have not seen, which is uh, Brown of Harvard from 1926. Um, there are films set uh, in educational settings, those institutions, usually Harvard or MIT. Um, there are social institutions um, that are uh, more from the Brahmin, the upper crust culture, historical and literary settings. Sports is an institution in Boston, of course. And so there are sports films. Uh, medical films, religious uh, institutions are tackled in several movies. And then of course the media, mostly the Boston Globe, but also some films about uh, alternative media. So I wanna go over a bunch of these films. I'm skipping this slide, but you can see there are a number of things. So early examples of films set in Boston and using Boston as a backdrop. Uh, Brown of Harvard is really the earliest. Uh, there are three versions of this movie, um, the earliest being 1911. Uh, there is also a version from 1918. And then this um, image that you see here is promoting the 1926 version, featuring a very young John Wayne as a Yale football player. Um, this is a movie about a kid who goes to Harvard and plays football. <laughs> um, and uh, then there's also Now Voyager with Betty Davis, uh, a wonderful romance that I've watched just recently for the first time. Uh, it's sort of jet setting, but it uses the Beacon Hill Brahmin um, archetype as a way to introduce Betty Davis's character as sort of a frumpy old maid, um, the daughter of a uh, of a dowager, you know, uh, uh, a rich dowager woman, a rich rich family on Beacon Hill, and she. Uh, finds love and life again by uh, voyaging outside of the crusty Beacon Hill house that she's been living in. Uh, it's a wonderful film. And then, as I said, Harvard really dominates all of these movies. Um, everything from, of course, Love Story, which I'm sure many of you have seen um, from 1970, which was a huge hit uh, leading to the release of The Paper Chase, which is set at Harvard Law School. Um, and that also became a surprise hit uh, and of course uh, created a, a whole new career for John Hausman who played the legendary Harvard professor in that movie. Um, the success of those two movies sparked a sort of mini wave of Harvard films um, in, the <clears throat> in the late 70s and early 80s. And then of course there are this sort of aspirational Harvard films where Harvard is represents sort of the highest possible pinnacle of uh, educational standards. Of course, that harkens back to Brown of Harvard, but uh, you'll see, you see Legally Blonde here from 2001, the absolutely absurd uh, and occasionally hilarious How High, in which uh, Method Man and Red Man smoke magical weed and it makes them incredibly smart and they get into Harvard that way. Um, there's The Exorable Soul Man, which is just a horrible movie about somebody in blackface trying to get into Harvard. Let's just fix that right now by making it go away. Uh, and then there's The Great Debaters, which is an interesting case. It's based in fact, uh, directed by Denzel Washington about a debate team from uh, traditionally uh, a black African-American college called Wiley College. Uh, and their debate team in the 30s became so proficient that they were able to take on uh, white colleges and break a color barrier really when it came to how debates were managed. So they actually rewrote history a little bit for that film. In, in reality, in the 1930s, um, Wiley defeated USC uh, in debate. But in this film, they make it all the way to Harvard, uh, again, positioning Harvard as the sort of dominant 
the, the best, uh, most intelligent institution you can find. So all you Harvard grads on, out there can enjoy that status. Um, of course, the historical settings in Boston and the great literary um, culture that has, uh, that has come here um, really uh, makes for some great backdrops for films. So you'll see that in The Bostonians, um, which, uh, which is directed by James Ivory. Uh, and from a Henry James novel. And then of course, Little Women, all the versions of Little Women are really great for one reason or another. But um, the I really love the 2019 version. Um, and uh, it makes great use of actual Boston locations as well as uh, locations that are central to the film outside of Boston. Boston even has the, um, the uh, fortunate uh, position of doubling for Paris in this movie uh, and European locations. So uh, that is a fun thing to look for when you're watching some of these films that were shot in Boston, but not set here. Um, moving on, I, I have to admit that I did not time myself doing this. So I want to use up as little time as possible. Um, there are many more Boston institutions. Uh, of course, sports are a huge uh, institution, as I said. So there's Fever Pitch, which is a really great romantic comedy. Uh, the not so great uh, Celtic Pride. <laughs> um, the uh, medical community is represented in Coma and Altered States, two sort of sci-fi movies, which actually feel like they could be remade today. Um, we've been talking a lot about what are the future stories that could be told in Boston. These two films are ripe for remake in our um, biotech industry. Um, and then, of course, the Catholic Church, a huge institution in Boston, is taken on in both The Verdict and Spotlight, which also addresses the institution of the media here in Boston and the Boston Globe being one of the um, uh, <clears throat> most respected papers in the country. I will just say that, even though someone will t debate me on that. And then transitioning us to a more independent set of films, there's Between the Lines, which is a really wonderful film by Joan Micklin Silver from 1977 uh, about a struggling independent uh, alternative newspaper called the Back Bay Main Line, even though their offices are clearly uh, located in Cambridgeport in the movie. It makes great use of Boston locations. Um, it's got a very young and sexy Jeff Goldblum in it, as well as a number of great uh, 70s and 80s actors in uh, or very early roles in their careers. It's a, it's a real character-driven movie. It's reminiscent of Robert Altman and uh, John Sayles, and I would absolutely recommend folks checking that out if they can. Um, many of these films we featured in our um, Boston Film Virtual Repertory series. Um, actually, here is a... Uh, so rather blurry shot from uh, between the lines, but you can see the old Harvard Square Station. Um, there is a uh, a man in a red jacket crossing this, the crosswalk, and that is Jeff Goldblum going to sell some records at Cheapo Records, which makes a great cameo in the film. So moving into the more, moving away from the institution films and into independent cinema, where we really start to get a different view of Boston and a more uh, inclusive view of Boston. Um, obviously, because so many people come to Boston to get their education, there are a lot of student films that are made here. Most of them are short films, um, but uh, two notable exceptions are Funny Ha Ha and Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. Um, Andrew Bajowski, who directed the movie Funny Ha Ha, um, started working on it when he was at Harvard. It's, a, uh, it's an extremely authentic Boston movie if you've spent any time living in Alston. Uh, there, there, there are really no landmarks featured in this movie. It takes place in nameless parking lots and dimly lit kitchens, um, but it's a great character study of a young woman who's just uh, a C after graduating from college and not really sure what she wants to do with her life. And then Guy and Madeline on a, on a park bench um, was made by Damien Chazelle while he was still attending Harvard uh, before he went on to become an Oscar winner for La La Land. And it's another, it's a similarly jazz uh, influenced and infused movie. It's a romantic comedy essentially, but uh, it's a fun film. The Brattle was uh, fortunate to premiere that in its original run in, in 2010. And of course, because so many people have 
gotten their education here, whether in film or not. Um, there are a lot of filmmakers that make, uh, that we can sort of lay claim to that don't make films expressly about Boston, but that's, that includes Darren Aronofsky from Harvard alone, I would say. Darren Aronofsky, Miguel Arteta, Tommy Lee Jones, Philip Kaufman, Terrence Malick, the great Mira Nair, Frank Pearson, Whit Stillman, producers um, like Lucy Fisher, who's a very prominent Hollywood producer, and Minette Louie, who's a very prominent independent producer. All of them were educated at Harvard, and that doesn't even take into account Emerson and Boston University um, and MIT, as well as anywhere else. So of course, there are, there are folks who didn't necessarily study in Boston, but grew up in the area or just gravitated here at some point um, and started making films. Brad Anderson's Next Stop Wonderland is probably the most well-known of these films. It is a, a gr another great romantic comedy uh, that works with the form of romantic comedy, but also outside of it. I just rewatched it recently for our podcast and I really enjoyed it. It's highly recommended uh, and features some great shots in the aquarium and on the blue line. Um, and he also made an incredibly tense and frightening film called Session Nine, um, which is all shot at the uh, closed down Danvers uh, Mental Hospital, uh, for which they had to do nothing. <laughs> there was no set dressing was needed for that film. Uh, it was creepy uh, as needed, just as it came. Uh, I know that Peter will be talking a little bit later about Jan Eagleson, but it's worth mentioning here that Jan is an educator at Boston University, but has also made some, or is also responsible for some of the earliest independent fiction films made in Boston with uh, Billy and the Lowlands, and of course, The Blue Diner, which is a, uh, another great film. And uh, I've unfortunately spelled Domain's name wrong on this slide, but Domain Davis and Carrie Streeter uh, were a uh, pair of filmmakers, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, who made a fantastic movie called Lift, a very early role from Carrie Washington. Um, it fits a little bit into the crime movies that we were talking about in the last panel, but um, it's also a great independent film with great performances. Uh, and again, highly recommended. Um, that's a quick overview of independent cinema. There are many films that I'm not mentioning. Um, there are films that are made, of course, using Salem as a backdrop, other locations in Massachusetts. Um, and some of those films uh, also make their way into greater Boston. So there are sort of other genres that take advantage of, of our city. Um, and it's rare, but they are, uh, we have been the setting for weirdo cult movies, horror films, broad comedies like Ted, of course, and uh, even big budget monster movies like Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, one of the strangest pairs of films in this <clears throat> kind of set is The House by the Cemetery and Ghost House, which are both, ma both made by legendary Italian horror directors, Lucio Fulci and uh, Umberto Lenzi. And they both are shot at a house in situate. And I really want to know if anybody out there has <laughs> knows the story of why uh, this great, beautiful house in situate was used for these two weirdo Italian productions. Um, the House by the Cemetery also makes extensive use of downtown Concord, which is incredibly strange um, and, uh, and wonderful. Of course, all the interiors for these movies were shot in, on a soundstage in Italy, but the, uh, but the exteriors of which there are many um, are, are in just walking down Main Street in Concord. Um, Knowing is a fun film that features Nicolas Cage in one of his over-the-top performances as an MIT professor. And uh, I want to uh, wrap this up a little bit by talking about Godzilla, King of the Monsters, which uh, unfortunately we can't experience in the ideal way right now because the best way to see this film is uh, in a downtown multiplex in Boston because at the end of the film, this is a terrible uh, image, but you can kind of see that there's a gigantic monster which has landed in the middle of Fenway Park. And uh, Boston is essentially destroyed in a firestorm at the end of this movie. And if you're watching it in a theater at uh, the Boston Common or the Fenway, for instance, and it gets to these scenes at the end, it is extremely strange and visceral experience to see the city you are, the area you're sitting in destroyed on screen as, you're, uh, as you are there. Uh, that pretty much wraps it up, but I do wanna note, we haven't even talked about documentaries. Um, here on this list, you can see some of the 
incredibly important names of uh, documentarians who have lived and worked and still live and work in, Bo in Boston and in Cambridge. Um, all amazing work and a series uh, for another time. So I think that is it from me. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Gavin. Hopefully you enjoyed that and I look forward to hearing questions later on. Right. Thank you very much, Ned. Um, so Jim, if you'd like to uh, turn your computer on, or I'm sorry, your <laughs> video on, <laughs> hopefully your computer is still on. <laughs> but, uh, your audio. All right. Thank you, Gavin. Um, as we were preparing uh, for this discussion, it occurred to me that uh, we're a little bit like the people in Plato's cave when we're watching these movies. Not only are we looking at flickering lights on a wall, but we're looking at the shadows of those lights, the reflections of the impressions of the movie makers, not the thing itself. We were uh, told in the last, in the first session that um, we had to remember that movie makers are not sociologists. They're storytellers. And that's true. But when the story is set intentionally in a place that we know, we become not just moviegoers, but citizens. And we naturally demand a, a right to judge whether the movie maker got things right, whether they got them wrong, whether they indulged in cliches or avoided them, and whether or not they teach us something we didn't know about the place that we call home and they call a location. The first movie that I wanted to talk about was The Bostonians. Uh, it was made in 1984. I hadn't seen it until, again, I, I saw it when it came out and I hadn't seen it again until recently. And I was amazed at how much it got right about the city uh, in that era. In the meantime, I had learned a little bit more than I knew back in 1984, uh, and that made the movie even better for me. The movie makers had a lot to work with, uh, a book by Henry James, a novel by Henry James, The Master, a uh, screenplay by Ruth Prower, Jabvala, which is terrific. Uh, it was a merchant ivory film, and as we're used to the lush settings that uh, they have in their films, and they were able to tap the Gibson House, the Boston Athenaeum, Memorial Hall at Harvard. But it was the intellectual atmosphere as much as the physical location that amazed me at, at how spot on they were. Uh, the frenzy and the foolishness of the social reform movement going on in Victorian Boston. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, we are all a little wild up here with numberless projects of social reform. Every reading man has a draft of a new community in his waistcoat pocket. When Julia Ward from New York married Samuel Gridley Howe, she said she was coming to Boston to meet the reformers and the cranks and the apostles. And they were all in this movie. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave just about vibrates with the reformist zeal. Um, Wallace Shawn is a reporter for, of course, the Boston Evening Transcript, and he's looking for the new, new thing in the social reform movement. Uh, and they portray, it's about, it's about the women's movement at the time. Um, uh, a feminist uh, meets, a, a feminist, uh, a young feminist speaker uh, falls in love with a, a Mississippi uh, cousin of a Bostonian uh, and sparks fly and uh, problems result. Uh, but you see the women's movement portrayed through this coterie around the character of Miss Birdseye, who's modeled after um, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, who was called the grandmother of Boston. Uh, she's played by Jessica Tandy, and it is terrific the way they, the way they do it. Um, in fact, there's, there's a, a scene at the end where they give a homage to um, the, the real Peabody by saying that uh, Vanessa Redgrave is going to write a letter to Miss Peabody, and they, they give her a name. Uh, it all climaxes at the Boston Music Hall, uh, which is referred to over and over again as... Uh, the place where everything happens. And it's true. And the music hall was on Hamilton Place. Parts of it still remain in uh, 
in parts of the Orpheum Theater. Uh, it's the place where Mark Twain was appearing when he wrote, Tonight I appear before a Boston audience, 4,000 critics. And so it all climaxes at the end. And will this young woman go forward with her speech on women's rights or will she be swept, swept off her feet and taken to New York by this uh, Basil Ransom character? Uh, and here the screenplay diverges from the novel because the screenplay has the Vanessa Redgrave character take the stage instead of her protege and it appropriates lines from um, uh, William Lloyd Garrison. So at the end, Vanessa Redgrave is up there talking about the women's movement and saying, I am in earnest, I will not equivocate, and I will be heard. It's not a great movie, but it's a great Boston movie. And I think it, you can tell a great Boston movie because the, the, better, the more you know about Boston, the better this movie gets. And I, I, I recommend people both to learn more about Boston and to see this movie. Um, the next movie I want to talk about is a contemporary movie and Ned mentioned it. It's called Lift. And it was written and directed by uh, locals, Domain Davis and Carrie Streeter, starring Kerry Washington before, the, before she became uh, more well known. And it has a terrific cast and it concerns uh, a young woman who is a personal shopper slash shoplifter in the back bay. Uh, and it has scenes from the back bay, but also from the Washington Park area of Roxbury. It's a really, really good movie. Not just as a crime movie, also as a movie about family, three generations of a family. It's a movie about community. And I wondered what was wrong with me that I hadn't seen it and that I hadn't heard anything about. And then I realized, why? It's a movie about black people. And it's a movie about black people in Boston. So there are two strikes against it. And there's something wrong with the movie industry and with society in general that this movie didn't get before a larger audience. I checked with Ned about this. And it only played at the film festivals. Um, to give them credit, the Museum of Fine Arts showed it. Uh, and then it went straight to video or straight to television. And so no one had a chance to see it. About 10 years ago, I was talking with Hubie Jones, one of Boston's great civil rights leaders. And he was describing his role as trying to be a peacemaker in 1967 in the riot that took place in the Grove Hall section of Boston when Boston police used uh, excessive force to end the demonstration by welfare mothers at the Grove Hall Welfare Office. And Yubi said he was starting to think that the white community in Boston would not pay attention to the black community until the riots weren't on Blue Hill Avenue, but were on Newbury Street. Recent events seem to have sadly proved him right about that. Uh, I feel badly for the people who made Lyft because it, it brought the black community to Boston, uh, to Newbury Street, and it still didn't get the attention that it deserved. And the, the last movie I want to talk about, it's a comedy, uh, 2013, The Heat. And in the first uh, program on this series, they talked about different Boston cliches. And the heat not only exploits, but explodes some of those cliches. Uh, instead of the Boston bros, you've got Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy uh, as uh, a, a New York-based FBI agent and a Boston cop. Uh, instead of the, it, it uh, expands on the typical dysfunctional Boston Irish family. Uh, and it does a great job setting up a, a scene with the Boston accent. Uh, one of Melissa's, Melissa, one of the guys that plays uh, Melissa McCarthy's brothers, um, not Joey McIntyre from Jamaica Plain, but uh, Nate Caudry from Weymouth, asks Sandra Bullock a question. Are you a knock? Sandra Bullock can't understand what he's saying. And he said, it, it's simple. Are you or are you not a knock? 
I thought I thought it was hilarious. It was they they pushed the envelope as far as it went. It was perfectly set up. But the other thing that this comedy does is that it sends us to places in Boston that we don't usually see, and it mashes things up. Melissa McCarthy supposedly lives in an apartment on in one of those uh, brick buildings along Seaver Street across from Franklin Park. Uh, this is, these buildings were built at the turn of the century when the Jews replaced the Irish in Roxbury Highlands. And they have since, of course, been replaced by blacks. Watching it as somebody who knows a little bit about Boston, I, I'm startled. How can Melissa McCarthy live here? What else am I going to see that I don't expect? And then for the rest of the movie, instead of the, the typical three-deckers and the working-class Irish, you see these cops chasing black and white people around the neighborhoods, and you see vacant lots and rundown brick tenements in places you don't expect to see in Boston. Um, you see the abandoned Area B police station in what was Dudley Square and is now Nubian Square. You see the abandoned Boston Herald building in what was the New York streets area and what they are now trying to call the ink block district. And for me, I was always surprised. I didn't know where it was going. I don't know if this is intentional or not, or whether the director and the people, other people making the movie didn't know enough about Boston to steer themselves into the cliches, but it was great to see. Uh, it kept you on the edge of your seat, and it was a funny movie. It was a comedy, but it also held your interest. So those are the, those are the three movies that I wanted to mention. And uh, again, I want to say that um, I think we do have a right to expect that when movie makers choose our home, choose Boston, um, that they and they intentionally start using it, that they get it right, that it uh, jibes with what we know of it, and hopefully that we can learn a little bit uh, that we didn't know about it and see places that we didn't see. Over to you. Great, thank you, Jim. Uh, so Peter, uh, we are now gonna ask you to turn on your uh, video and um, tell us about the Blue Diner. Um, uh, La Fonda Azul, the Blue Diner, the some wonderful small independent movie, um, as Ned said, um, directed and written, uh, co-written by Jan Eagleson, um, that came out in 2001. And um, it accidentally has an institutional um, uh, connection. That's not the theme of the movie, but as a, um, uh, Gavin made uh, a reference to this, so let me explain. Um, um, to move the, it's a romantic comedy with very, that discusses very serious issues within the guise of being a romantic comedy. But one of the um, um, uh, uh, points in um, the uh, script is that a young artist try, who's um, um, uh, undocumented, um, immigrant um, tries to establish himself as um, a recognized artist um, and to um, allow him to uh, remain in the United States by uh, sneaking a painting, one of his own paintings, into the Museum of Fine Arts and putting it on display there hoping he'll catch attention that allow him to say, to, to say he's the romantic lead in this uh, story. The, um, it's a kind of clever device um, and also sh it goes to the point of uh, what, what, does, what is the purpose of art and art is not, comes from people's experience. So um, in this movie you have uh, the people walking up to the entrance of the Museum of Fine Arts but then when they cross the threshold, they're at the Massachusetts Historical Society because I think very late in the, in the actual production of this film, the Museum of Fine Arts thought that this, they weren't being presented in the most flattering way and withdrew permission to film within the museum. And this um, put the uh, uh, production company for the Blue Diner in an awful circumstance. And we were able to uh, rescue them in the last few days of their 
uh, shooting. They'd already filmed some scenes at the Boston Public Library uh, as backdrop to this. But in doing so, uh, it meant that uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is uh, another cultural institution in Boston, became the sort of stunt double for the Museum of Fine Arts uh, and is featured substantially in this movement, uh, in this movie. So when I discuss it, I have to suspend judgment because I saw in a very back of the scene way participated in the production of this film. But it's um, uh, a really a wonderful and provocative movie. Uh, Jen Eagleson, and I'll say a, uh, a little bit about him in just a minute. But before that, I want to point out that the person he worked um, with, who's um, uh, worked for, she's photographed here in front of uh, another poster for the movie, is uh, Natasha Estebanez, um, who um, is was a documentary filmmaker associated with WGBH who came up with this idea based upon her own life experience coming to the United States from Puerto Rico and, and feeling even after 20 years um, spent in the United States that she still, and coming from a part of the United States, that she was still very much seen as an immigrant and an outsider. So she wants, she said, in describing her idea, she said she wanted to make a film that had in it people who looked like herself. And that's what she very successfully set out to do. And in um, coming in contact through their professional careers with Jan Eagleson, who had made a, a series of small independent films here, um, they worked together. They co-wrote this movie, which is truly bilingual. You can, if you see it at, at, on a, um, at home or on a DVD, you can um, uh, have uh, uh, Spanish or English language um, uh, subtitles, but it's a movie that moves back and forth um, between English and Spanish, uh, uh, depending on the characters in it. It's also, Boston is a small place making films, this film was very much a family affair because um, uh, um, this is Estimates' husband, um, Claudio Ragazzi, who wrote the music um, for this uh, film. He's a um, person who came from Argentina, um, has um, done music for many um, films, and uh, uh, has taught at um, the Berkeley College. Um, uh, here in the Back Bay. But he's also, to sh show these connections, he also orchestrated um, Next Stop Wonderland. So there's this wonderful crossover between people who participate in this film enterprise here. And if we go on to the next slide, that I've just given a little um, background of Jan Eagleson's movies and um, uh, Ned spoke about Billy in the Lowlands, which is a remarkable film from 1979. It uh, looks like they just gave some teenagers um, in uh, Cambridge and Somerville a movie camera and they made a, a sort of documentary movie about their lives. It's, a, it's, um, it's not, it's a, it's a constructed movie, with, um, but nevertheless, it has the feel of this time and this place. He uh, made an, another um, uh, movie um, along the same lines, Dark End of the Street, um, and it shows the evolution of his films. I realize I've left off what many people think is the third film in a trilogy of films, The Little Sister, that came out a few years later, which is a much more accomplished film as filmmaking and has um, uh, people who later on had significant careers in Hollywood as the stars of it. He's, um, Eagleson's made a, a range of uh, films, uh, independent films, commercial films, and um, films for both um, that have been, um, had their primary outlet in both public television and then television movies and episodic television. Um, but the Blue Diner falls sort of in the middle of this uh, series of films. It's a, a wonderful to look at. Um, it's very hard to show any of the movie that's, of course, 
protected by copyright, but also uh, difficult to show in the Zoom format. It's also a movie that didn't get wide release, so it's it's somewhat difficult to locate a copy of it um, being a library. And I will point out that um, your local library, and libraries are open at least to make um, materials available for loan now, your uh, local library or a library, I'm I know people are watching this from perhaps far afield, but here in the area, the library still um, maintain copies of films or um, are, are films to download um, uh, as part of their collections. And that might be your best access to at least several of um, these films. And if we go on, I've just included um, uh, still from, uh, this is from Billy in the Lowlands, which is not actually in Boston, but in the um, uh, 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 you know, tough parts of towns just north of Boston. Um, when we talk about Boston films, I think we often um, cross over um, um, into a near Boston in the Boston area. Um, uh, and if we um, uh, uh, go back, I think, to the Blue Diner, I'll just end by um, pointing out that the Blue Diner, as I was saying, is uh, wonderful in that in the year 2000, people came together uh, to make a film about people who do not appear in um, a traditional movies set in um, Boston, the Hispanic community, people, Spanish speaking people who are coming from Puerto Rico and Cuba and other places in Latin America, from Mexico, South America, um, that all these people are coming together who are connected by um, language outside of the language spoken by most Bostonians, but connected by uh, speaking Spanish, but at the same time are um, represent uh, different traditions and cultures and backgrounds within their own community. Uh, this is a movie that's essentially the the theme and story are the important part of it, but it has wonderful Boston um, settings. And I, I'd be neglectful with, if I didn't point out that the Blue Diner itself, which, which is uh, down on Nealon Street by South Station, and it's gone through many guises and a number of different names, an all night diner, a traditional diner, nevertheless um, is a perfect example of this. Um, it's a very busy 24 hour place so there are exterior shots at the Blue Diner, but just as in the case of the Museum of Fine Arts and uh, um, in the Massachusetts Historical Society, when uh, characters cross uh, the doorway into the Blue Diner, the interiors were actually filmed in a diner in Watertown, um, which has a different feel to it, but I suspect was an easier play, place to, to um, make a film. The film is terrific looking. Um, there's a legend that one of the reasons that they could make a, 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 a such a grand movie on a very limited budget is they got a hold of all the excess film stock from the movie Titanic. So it's made at a very high level of quality. A movie that cost about a million dollars then, which would be about a million and a half dollars now, I think, but nevertheless um, brought together um, accomplished people both in front of and behind the camera. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, another great example of a film set in Boston. Uh, so Jim and Ned, if you'd like to come back and turn your cameras on, um, we um, can probably do one or two questions from me. Um, and then uh, the audience is, of course, welcome to submit questions using the Q&A uh, and to raise their hands. And we'll try to get a couple questions from uh, the audience as well. Um, so one th thing that I've sort of thought about is that um, Boston today has the third highest cost of living in America. It's the biotech center of the world and has the highest concentration of venture capital in the United States. Uh, but that's not at all what's depicted in films about Boston or films set in Boston. There's certainly the gritty crime Boston, but most of the films that you're talking about are, are either sort of elite uh, academic Ivy League um, or often sort of smaller, more neighborhood things. Um, 
do you think that at any point uh, Boston will get out of its sort of historical depiction and actually have films made that show it as this vibrant biotech and, and technology center? No. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the biotech things set in Boston are horror stories. That's right, right. I think that, you know. <laughs> like, in fact, right. they're predicted that movie in an interesting way movies often go down a dark road that the world then follows them um, into rather than being kind of uh, documenting the existing world. but it's interesting to think about um, uh, Boston has become so international and essentially uh, that I, I think what makes it attractive are that those that feeling of place some of that has been lost if you look at a movie from 20 years ago um there are scenes that are um in the blue diner that are now historical um and the sense of the changes that have taken place my my answer would be i hope not um because if it does it isn't boston it isn't different and the homogenization that is taking place if you're talking about financial services or high tech or anything like that, means that Boston could be anywhere. Uh, and it's somewhat, somewhat like the seaport district. Uh, you don't know that you're in Boston. So movies about the economy, this new high tech world economy, uh, are going to be, I think, fairly bland when it comes to place. Yeah, I mean, they, they, there are some films like... Um like Night and Day, which is a Tom Cruise thriller that are set in Boston just because. Um, and so there are always the possibility that films like that can be made within the um, areas that you're talking about, Kevin. I think that if somebody came up with, you know, like you're mentioning Coma, Peter, and as I was saying in my presentation, I feel like Coma or Altered States could be remade today within the biotech um you know, industry here um, in a different way. I think if somebody conceives of a story within those, you know, milieu, to use a fancy word, then um, then I think they could happen. But it's not going to, it's never going to erase the movies, the two other sort of sets of films that we're talking about here, the, the crime movies or the, you know, films that focus on the working class. And then the sort of like, highfalutin um, Boston Brahmin kind of kind of aesthetic. Right. So uh, somewhat tied to what you just said, um, I just sort of have been thinking that uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, um, we've seen a number of long-standing establishments that have closed their doors permanently. Um, being in Cambridge, I was just thinking of uh, things like the Cantab and the Field and Cafe Pamplona, um, all of whom have closed down in the last month or so. Um, do you think that uh, this current moment that we're in, the city is in danger, in danger of losing some of the identity that makes it such a vibrant place for films? Yes. And I, I think most of it's already gone. Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem, there was not a lot of evidence that it's coming back. I, I mean, I, I would say, we, we, we talked on our podcast a little bit about um, how Boston seems to be a continually changing city, even though it does have this, you know, real commitment to its history. And so, and certainly what I've seen in Harvard Square, you know, I've been working here for over 20 years and I've spent basically my whole life in and around Harvard Square. Um, it's constantly changing. It's constantly going away from what everybody thinks of as their Harvard Square or their Boston. But, um, you know, I, I, I do think that you're right in a way, Gavin, that these special places, I mean, you know, the Harvard Square cinema was a special place and it's been vacant for, you know, years now. Um, so there are, th there is a threat to that kind of character but there's so much character in greater Boston as a whole that it, it, it would be hard for it to completely disappear. Um, but the high rent and the, you know, the focus on innovation technology right now means that it's not, 
it's hard for a DIY, you know, art space to, to happen now. Whereas, or a, you know, something like the Orson Welles cinema, which was like a playground for hippies um, to watch great movies. And now I don't know that that would, it would be very difficult for that to come into existence now. And um, it's hard for people who do not have uh, a high income to live here. And right. when the diversity of the people in the city go, uh, the, the city goes, the, the diversity goes, and, and you have anywhere, USA, anywhere, planet Earth. I remember actually a long time ago, um, speaking of Harvard Square, when the Harvard Square Business Association was having its 100th anniversary, they did a, a series of interviews, um, one of which was with uh, Executive Director of the Cambridge Historical Commission, Charles Sullivan. Um, and he said, uh, Harvard Square, everyone falls in love with Harvard Square the first minute they, the first time they meet it, and it's been going downhill for all of them ever since. <laughs> it's just this sort of continual process of, it's always disappointing. Um, but um, I also do remember the Orson Welles Theater, which, uh, if I'm correct, uh, held the record for showing one movie more times than any other cinema uh, in America, and they showed the film The Gods Must Be Crazy every single day for years and years and years. So uh, maybe not the most uh, illustrious thing, but. Um, so we have a couple of people who've raised their hand. Here comes Mimi. Hey, Gavin, I thank you. Uh, I want to follow the point that Gavin has made about the biotech, the concentration of biotech in Boston. Not only that, but you have the world a world-class medical professions in high tech. So uh, if you, Peter, the question more towards you, uh, the movie Blue Diner, which I mean, you know, it's like a represented the unbridgeable, you know, you can never belong because if from Puerto Rico, you have to be bilingual, people just exclude you. But on the other hand, Boston is more open than anywhere in the US because, you know, the, the biotech industries and the medical professions, engineering, so they brought the world-class people, you know, they blended in, they become the elite class. You know, uh, you have one diversity, which is they are not able to catch up with the living standards of Boston cultures. But there's another group of a huge diversity. It, they are the elite. You know, they, they, they represent the American dream, right? And, uh, and they, for instance, some places, you know, the housing price, it goes with this group of professionals because they really because of them the housing price goes up right so um now diversity to me in boston seems that there are two narratives one is immigrants struggling day-to-day -day life you know they can never uh, have a sense of belong the other group of immigrants they are leading people they are leading class re ruling class actually in the scientific uh, field right uh, so then how the film industry you know represent these two types of diversities because you know um boston to me is more open than anywhere in the world how can you say you do not belong Peter, did you want to take a shot at that? Um, I think there's, I, I think the, the pl place this seems to me to present some um, challenge is how you convey this into film. You know, is, is this is this um, rapidly changing large um, uh, enterprise, the biotechnology and medicine here in Boston. And I, there are wonderful stories there. In fact, what's really, to me, interesting is how badly some of these stories have been told in films. Uh, um, there's um, uh, a very early um, a Michael Crichton um, book, A Case of Need, that was made into a, to my way of thinking, um, a really dreadful movie, this sort of lost opportunity to have a movie at least partly set in old Boston City Hospital. So there's, along the way, um, I think that those ideas have been there, but it's been hard for, I don't, I, I, I can't, it's hard for me to think of places where it's, people have been successful in showing um, modern scientific enterprise or medical um, work in a way that um, has a story that makes a, a, a good movie. So um, Kathy typed in, uh, since, you're all, since you've all thought uh, about these things quite a bit, are there stories, novels, neighborhoods, themes uh, that you wish uh, could, 
could make it to the big screen. Um, I've got a list, <laughs> um, a short list. I think um, I would like to see a busing movie made. Um, we have Spotlight now as, as a model. Uh, I, it's, I think it's necessary, it's overdue. Uh, we have never really learned how to talk about busing. Um, if someone could come along and give us a good movie about it, it might help. The only, my only caveat would be that if someone did take it on and um, chose to tell the story of busing through families, they would do uh, a different job, choose a, a different group of people than uh, we saw in Common Ground and not rely necessarily on the same um, leading figures of the city to tell it. I think there's a way to tell the difficult and complicated story of busing well, and again, I'm, I'm using Spotlight as a template. That, that's a difficult and complicated story, and somebody figured out how to get it right. Uh, and the, the, the two others that I had on my list were something about first-generation college kids going to college in Boston. We've got all these colleges, but we've got all this, you know, love story business and social network stuff. But to me, there's a chance for a really good movie about someone who's a first-generation college kid from any one of Boston neighborhoods trying to, to make it uh, in college and the challenges they face. I think that would be terrific. And the third on, on my list would be gentrification, which is something we're all, you know, worried about and dealing with, uh, the loss of identity of the city, uh, but also the loss of the... Uh, working class uh, and the poor. Uh, and I'd like to see an intelligent uh, movie uh, take on the issue of gentrification in Boston. I think that would be a real plus. Ned or Peter, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I was just uh, prompted by a mutual friend of ours, Gavin, that that the Gardner heist is ripe for a fiction film. I actually made a point recently on another Zoom call. I think that uh, that I think maybe the the solution to the Gardner heist will come through a an unguarded Zoom moment. I believe it was <laughs> talking with you, you fellows, uh, Jim, the the portrait behind you. I thought. Well, perhaps someone would be erroneously displaying. Gilbert Stewart, uh, I know. And the, the Museum I of Fine Arts wasn't it. using it, so I thought. <laughs> Anyways, yes, the Gardner Heist, you know, I mean, I think going back to those, um, this, there is a, a, an interesting um, audio documentary about the Gardner Heist, but, but no, uh, no fiction films have been made that I know of. That would be a good one. And the bus <laughs> Books I think the Boston about, film is the great, you know, Boston story. There are great books about Boston that um, um, haven't been made into films, but there are also events that I think, uh, uh, I think working at the Massachusetts Historical Society tend to look perhaps backwards, but uh, in the 19th century, in terms of thinking about things like medicine, the... Uh, introduction of anesthesia at Massachusetts General Hospital. It seems like a dry idea, but it's an epic struggle between competitors. It has all of these vivid characters in it. And it's followed almost immediately by a lurid murder at um, the Harvard Medical School when it was downtown in Boston, where one professor murders another um, the kind of crime of the 19th century, just along those lines, that, that would be an opportunity to look back at um, uh, a time and place. Uh, there's never, to my way of thinking, been a good movie about the American Revolution. And as we come towards the 250th anniversary of a lot of events associated with that, I sure wish someone would make a try and try to figure out how to put the interesting things that happened here into a story like that. I think we have time for one more question. So um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting Leah. Hi, Ned. Hi, yeah. and everybody. Yeah, I've enjoyed your talk very much. And I'm an old Harvard Square person. 
came here in the early 70s and incidentally a, a big film fan. That's why I'm here, of course, at this talk. And uh, Ned, I worked at the Brattle in, in the mid 80s. Oh. So, um, you know, this is a topic that's very interesting to me. And I can't thank you enough for all the great movies you've shown. And especially I saw Between the Lines and the Bostonians there recently. So I'm enormously grateful to you. And, um, oh, and by the way, that movie that played in Cambridge for years was King of Hearts. It was at the Central Square. See, you're all nodding. Um, yeah. it was, and give her the know. moon. King of Hearts and give her the moon. But it was mostly King of Hearts yeah. that people always went to see. And yeah. The Gods Must Be Crazy was at the Wells, I think, but, you know, but not that long. So I'm, I'm, Orson Welles is in my DNA, of course, too, with Wong the Brown. Um, well, I and um, and uh, The Harder They Come, that was also a huge, yes. like, long, they like, used to have, The Wells used to have 75-cent matinees. That's how old, that's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> 75 cents. To go to the Orson Welles in the in the afternoon matinee. Well, there, there were dollar movies all over Boston. The, the new Pixie oh. at Hyde Park, uh, West and Park all the you know the Park. Somerville and I, I I remember seeing The Godfather in Medford Square, and the lights went up, and I was surrounded by Italians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was the only Irish face in the crowd, <laughs> so that was memorable too. So um, let me think if I have any questions for you. Well, I, Jim, I thought your ideas for future Boston films were terrific. And Thank you. You wrote about it, address the busing story. That was a very dramatic one. And uh, I'm on all these lost Boston and dirty old Boston pages, and every time busing comes up, um, there's a, a frantic discussion about it. And my take on it is those people in um, Charlestown they didn't want it to turn into Roxbury, you know, and that's all they associate with, you know, blacks coming to their neighborhood. So they saw Roxbury as a real bad it, and dangerous place. Yeah, I, I just have to say it's so complicated uh, it's, as someone who spent a lot of time on it. And, and that's why I really like a really good filmmaker to make a movie that, that um, sorts out all the different threads and gives it the, the kind of intelligent somewhat distant treatment that it deserves to, to, to sort out the emotional side and the intellectual side and the behavioral side and the educational side. Um, that's why, and that's why I use Spotlight as a model because uh, those people, the people who made that movie had to do those things. Well, it, was, it was a great film. So uh, I wanna be conscious of people's time where uh, just a little bit past an hour. Um, do any of you want to share a movie that you think a person visiting Boston uh, should see? Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So Ned, do you have a, uh, if you had a friend visiting from out of town who had never been to Boston, they wanted to get a sense of what the city was like, what movie would you tell them to see? Um, none of them. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's just not, there are, uh, you know, I mean, I love the Thomas Crown Affair. I think it's a great movie, and it's got some good, you know, Boston footage in it. But I don't think there's a film that authentically captures, you know, visiting Boston without seeming too much like a travelogue or a or a contrived. But you know, I mean, Friends of Eddie Coyle is my really my hands down, you know. Thomas Crown Affair and Friends of Eddie Quill. Those are my two favorite Boston movies. So I can't say they'll give you a, uh, a, a an accurate portrayal of Boston now for sure, but uh, they are fun movies to watch. Uh, Jim or Peter, did you have any that you'd offer? I I think that if you, um, it, we say Beacon Hill, but I think it's supposed to be in the movie on Marlboro's at Bay. Um, but I think, um, uh, the the first part of Now Voyager, which shows how an establishment becomes essentially pathological, um, uh, this inbred, um, closed environment of this intellectual um, and um, uh, um, the uh, Boston elite self-styled Brahmins. Um, I think 
I, I used to really like the movie because I thought it was entirely imagined, you know, in Hollywood of what Boston looked like. And I think it largely is. But I think in capturing the, a sensibility of what Boston, you know, as you walk those sort of grand parts of Boston, what that, what was going on within, I think it, that's actually something worth thinking of. It's very romantic and very 1940s, but at the same time, I, I think there are some insights um, there worth thinking about and seeing. And it's just a great movie. So well, um, I just say that I think it's a problem because the, the Boston that most of us know and love is, is really no more. Uh, I'd like to recommend The Last Hurrah, but those days are gone. Uh, I'd recommend Eddie Coyle. That's the Boston that I knew when I first came in 1966, the, the Boston of uh, cafeterias, uh, Hayes Bickford's and Waldorf's and the Kentucky Tavern, but that's gone. Um, unfortunately, when I knew this question was coming. The, the one that I came up with to represent Boston, the best to represent Boston today would be something like Next Stop Wonderland, because it's uh, Boston is, is now it's a city of young people and people that make a lot of money uh, could almost be set anywhere. And at least with Next Stop Wonderland, you've got the blue line tying things together. You've got a little bit of diversity. Um, you, you've got something going for it without it being too far off the mark. Well, thank you all. Uh, I think this was a, a great program. Um, and for our guests, um, I would uh, tell them that I would hope that they will consider supporting the Bridal Film Foundation. This is the, uh, the URL to go to if you'd like to do that. Um, and also, if you enjoyed this program, um, I would point out that the MHS is an independent nonprofit. Um, and if you want us to keep doing programs like this, I hope you'll consider uh, joining or making a contribution to the Mass Historical Society. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone for coming and, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Gavin. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.